Introductory note of Sheriff Larrabee's Prisoner. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Wales. Sheriff Larrabee's Prisoner by Martin Dexter, pseudonym for Max Brand. Introductory note. When this short novel first appeared in the December 3, 1921 issue of Western Story magazine, the editor assigned Frederick Faust a new pseudonym for the story, Martin Dexter, but this would be the only time this name would be used as a Faust byline. Faust used other byline names at this time, David Manning, George Owen Baxter, and Max Brand these multiple identities were intended to make the readers think that each one was a different and distinct author End introductory note chapters one and two of sheriff larrabee's prisoner by martin dexter pseudonym for max brand this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter one no hangout the rain had been falling steadily with a nor'wester to drive it aslant now the wind leaped suddenly at jack montaigne and as if its former pace had been maintained only to lure him into a false security it now drove the rain in level volleys that crashed against his slicker and stung his face even his weather-hardened hands resented the fury of the storm the blast stopped the trot of his pony that remained for the moment leaning into the storm presently it again gathered headway urged on by the tickling spur of the rider when the anger of the wind and rain had spent itself montaigne screened his eyes and peered anxiously up the valley it was then he made out the two lights one a mere yellow ray which passing through the mist of rain was split into a thousand shivering portions as montaigne squinted at it and the other merely a dim red blur they were welcome sights to the rider on this black night and yet he hesitated before going straight toward them eventually he decided that the news about him could not have preceded him to this desolate valley and he touched the pony with the spurs again this time the weary beast broke into a lope cupping the muddy water on the trail in the hollows of his forehoofs and sending it up in spurts and showers to drench the rider but against such physical discomforts jack montaigne was proof when the possessions of a man have shrunk to his bridle and saddle and horse and the old gun sagging at his hip when moreover fear and dread ride at his side the elements are negligible factors in truth the storm fitted in with the mood of montaigne and his temper rose in fierce bursts of revolt against the world just as the wind occasionally struck at him with redoubled force and like the night his mind was filled with a steady black gloom the red light on his right now grew rapidly the rain streaked down against it and above the light he made out the outline of a tree some one was sitting by a campfire to the lee of a tree and that was his only shelter against this furious storm there was no other conclusion to come to and montaigne shook his head in wonder perhaps the fellow had not seen that light down the road that light which evidently came from a house it was partly with a kindly determination to tell the camper that there was a better shelter in sight and partly with the hope of learning a little about this valley in which he found himself that montaigne turned to the right and came squarely upon the fire it was a miserable and uncertain blaze fizzing and hissing constantly as drops of water filtered down from the boughs of the tree above and yet the broad trunk made a rather good shelter for the steady wind kept driving the rain at an angle and the man whose back was against the tree was in no danger of getting wet by the direct fall of water only the drops that trickled through the foliage above came splashing about him he had been stirring weakly at the fire and it was not until the pony came within a yard of the blaze snorting in disgust as the smoke filled its nostrils that the camper lifted to the view of montaigne a white rat-like face out of which little bright black eyes glittered 
get your own fire bow said the camper without waiting to learn definitely the purpose of the new arrival i ain't got any more than enough room for myself and i ain't going to let you in get on your way and hustle your own fire he enforced this suggestion with an ugly lifting of his upper lip very much after the manner of a terrier guarding a bone but jack montaigne did not immediately answer he waited until his observations had taken in all the details of the battered hat the coat of nameless age and patches the shoes through the ends of which the toes were thrusting and the whole atmosphere of unclean suspicion that dwelt about the tramp like a garment you dirty rat said jack montaigne when he broke silence i ought to twist your neck into two pieces what demanded the tramp starting as he shaded his eyes with his hands and peered half viciously and half curiously up through the darkness as if he wished with all his heart to attack the man who had insulted him but first must make sure that such an attack would be an expedient proceeding that which he saw was apparently extremely discouraging for he settled back against the tree and changed his open defiance to a sullen scowl but went on jack montaigne smiling in spite of himself at this change of front i'm going to do you a good turn instead of kicking you away from that fire and out into the mud i'm going to tell you that there is a house down the road about a mile you don't have to stay here you can go down there and sleep in the barn anyway can i asked the tramp all right you go and try it that's all i got to say you go and try it he wrapped his arms about him shivering as the wind grew fresher out of the north and he grinned in mockery at the rider did you try it asked the rider with a sudden sternness that was not however directed at the tramp did you try it and get turned out into a night like this maybe replied the tramp the rider set his teeth in one of those convulsions of anger which seemed to be characteristic and the tramp peering at him by the dim firelight shrank from what he saw but uh, are there no other houses around here asked montaigne find out for yourself said the tramp he had been emboldened by the generous indignation of the night rider as if this were proof that the larger man would not take advantage of his superior size or the revolver that was faintly outlined under the skirt of his slicker find out for yourself that's what i had to do jack montaigne considered that lean pointed face with a thoughtful contempt no he decided at length i won't look any farther i'll go to that house yonder and i'll get supper and a bed there whether they want to give it to me or not if they turn even a dog out into this sort of weather they don't deserve no consideration and i ain't going to give it to em if you want to come along with me i'll see that they put you up too but the tramp merely laughed i ain't no fool he declared i ain't going to walk that far for nothing besides i'm doing fine right here so long then said montaigne the tramp returned no answer but he followed the stranger with a bright glance of his little eyes as montaigne swerved out into the storm again through the crashing of the rain jack kept steadily for the house presently he saw the light in the window grow brighter and he made out the shadowy form of a big ranch house one of those long and ragged roof lines that attest many additions built on to the original and central structure turn a stranger away from such a place where there must be room to put up twenty extra men his anger grew with every stride of his pony when at length he drew rein his jaw was set it was the rear of the house he had approached and the light came from a projecting wing that was evidently the kitchen as montaigne swung out of the saddle he stepped from the blast of the storm into the quiet shelter of the building pausing at the door he heard two voices both raised one the harsh voice of a woman and one a man's voice if he don't get the money out of that chest said the man where does he get it anyway i'm going to find out if shut up exclaimed the woman let me tell you here she lowered her voice until it became unintelligible to montaigne and he rapped heavily on the door the voices ceased then there was a shuffling of feet the turning of the doorknob as someone called out to him who's there 
it was the same growling voice of the man whom he had heard speaking inside the kitchen a stranger partner said montaigne pleasantly held up in this rain and i'd like to get a place to sleep and a bite to eat this ain't no hang-out for bums answered the other fiercely just get out and stay out and the door was slammed in the face of montaigne but in that moment he flung himself forward leaning low his shoulder and its cushion of hardened muscle presented for the shock after the fashion of a football player the door had been slammed but the latch had not yet clicked home and the lunging body of montaigne knocked the door wide the burly fellow was sent spinning across the floor of the kitchen and crashed into the wall, and Montaigne, crouched low and staggering, entered. When he straightened himself he saw the man of the house scrambling to his feet, uttering a profusion of terrific curses. Then the big-shouldered, loose-jointed fellow sprang to the wall and caught a shotgun off the nails where it was supported. He did not, however, level the gun at Montaigne something in the face of the stranger arrested the motion his close-set bulging eyes dwelt in a sort of daze on the newcomer and montaigne thought he had never seen features so animal-like save in the woman she also had reached for the nearest weapon sweeping up a great butcher knife in her work reddened hands but like her son the relationship was proclaimed in their faces her motion to strike was arrested for they saw in the newcomer a man well over middle height, so strong and sinewy that even the loose flapping folds of the slicker could not entirely disguise his power. More than this he was in a tremendous passion, which his silence made more terrible than a profusion of curses. In relaxation he must have been a handsome man, but now his features expressed nothing but consuming rage his brows were black above his glaring eyes his nostrils quivered his mouth was a straight white-edged line and the tendons of his neck stood forth moreover point was given to his anger by the fact that his right hand was under his slicker beyond a doubt it was grasping the butt of a revolver two the hosts of the house the son had no cunning with which to adapt himself to this terrible stranger the woman possessed more adroitness she cast at her son one flaming glance and shook her head clearly she admonished him to give over the thought of violent resistance to violence then she slipped the knife back on to the table and turned to montaigne with complaints instead of fury what sort of a business is this she demanded busting down doors and breaking in on honest folk is that a way to act i say is that a way she put a whine into her voice to be sure but her eyes were still sparkling with rage although she told her son with a curse at his stupidity to put down the shotgun i ain't going to have no murder on your head she declared not even if the law won't lay no hand on you for defending your own house and home now you what do you want the anger had been gradually departing from jack montaigne like most men liable to fits of murderous temper his rage passed away almost as swiftly as it had come over him, but his face was still ominous as he replied to the woman's demands. "'I've heard about you folks,' he said, turning people out into this sort of a storm, but I didn't believe it. Now I'm going to talk straight. I ain't got a cent, but I'm going to get a dry place to sleep, and I'm going to get a place for my hoss and feed for it in the barn. I'm going to get supper for myself. You lay to that i say i ain't got a cent on me now but when i come back i'll pay you every cent it's worth and then double you can trust that i never been known to break a promise but whether you trust me or not i'm going to get what i said i get now listen i'm going to take my hoss out to the barn yonder and find feed for him then i'm coming back here and i expect to find supper started for me understand i fed a hundred gents in my time and never took nothing for it now i'm going to get a little part of it back so saying he stepped backward into the night and slammed the door behind him no sooner had it closed than the sun slipped to it and laid the great bolt softly in place then he turned with a grin of triumph to his mother we'll lock him out confound him he said think you can hold out one like him asked the woman not if you were ten times the man you are gus it would have taken your father ay or a better one than your father to handle this one 
on no, no replied gus i can do my share if i got a chance and ain't took by surprise i know if you got a chance to sneak up on somebody and get a gun trained on em you're as brave enough but don't try to sneak up on the gent that just come in here know why why asked her son blinking she slipped a little closer to him and glanced aside at the door through which montaigne had just disappeared as if fearful that he might return at that instant and overhear because he's a killer she whispered i know that kind you see the way he rocked a little from side to side he was so mad you seen the way he went white and the veins sprang out purple on his forehead you seen the way his eyes went jumpin everywhere that's because he was a killer he had his hand on his gun and he wouldn't have thought nothing of blowing off both our heads oh i know the likes of him and i know him well he's a bad un gus and you can lay to that don't try no fancy work on him the pale brutish eyes of gus opened wide as he drank in this information then the woman went to the door removed the bolt again and shook her fist in a consuming burst of rage why should he have come on this night of all nights she snarlingly demanded we'll just have to put it off said the son you fool replied his amiable mother why was i cursed by having a coward and an idiot for a son but you're like your father before you no sense like a swine just made for eating and drinking and sleeping and grunting in your sleep bah the son replied to this outburst of affection with a wicked glint of his eyes and a twitching of his loose upper lip but apparently he had had too much experience of the virago's tongue to invite a fresh outburst how can we put it off ain't we got to have the money by tomorrow she went on as savagely as before you think you can put off cusack no nah, not that leech he'd foreclose in a minute his mouth is waterin at the idea of gettin the ranch anyway and now this killer comes and shut up muttered the son as an idea flashed across his brutish face maybe this ain't the worst that could happen this having the stranger with us tonight maybe we could make him his mother checked him with a raised hand and the next moment the door opened and jack montaigne entered the room again this time he came rather carelessly even whistling as if he were now an old acquaintance he settled himself in a chair leaned back against the wall and twitched the holster at his right hip so that the butt of the gun fell into a convenient position he regarded the pair with quiet interest they gave him a glance in return and then busied themselves in laying out a supper of cold ham and cold fried potatoes and lukewarm coffee left over from their own evening meal without a word they served him without a word he drew up his chair and began to eat as has been said before he was a good-looking fellow except when his face was contorted by rage he had an ominously sudden way of glancing from side to side and the muscles of the jaw were strongly developed as in one who habitually kept his teeth set in actual years montaigne could not have been more than twenty-seven or eight but hard experience of one kind or another had touched his hair with a streak of gray over the temples he was a man of many expressions looking down he often seemed middle-aged and weary looking up he seemed years younger when he smiled he was suddenly a boy filled with geniality and now he said as he approached the conclusion of that cheerless meal where do i sleep in the barn said the woman savagely i guess hay is good enough for you sure agreed jack montaigne only you are so kind of generous about making me accept things ever since i landed here that i thought maybe you'd want me to sleep in a nice comfortable bed in the house he grinned as he spoke but gus said and so we do there's a spare bed in the room right next to mine and do you think i'll have him in the house asked the woman but her son winked at her and regarding her steadily he said shut up and let me talk ain't i the man about this house i say he's going to sleep inside he had raised his voice to a shout and his mother submitted to him with suspicious suddenness at the same moment a slow feeble step was heard descending the stairs a step that hesitated like the movement of extreme old age you got the old devil up with your yelling said the woman now he'll make us all dance for it 
The next moment a bent old man came into the doorway. If the woman and her boy were of bearish temper and bearish conformation, the old fellow who now came before the view of Jack Montaigne was certainly of the wolf breed. His eagle nose, his grimly compressed lips, his forward-jutting chin, and, above all, the cold, keen eyes under the bushy white brows told of a predatory soul. Years had bowed him, but there was something so significant about him that the hawk-like figure seemed to tower above them all. It was rather as if he had stooped to come through the doorway than as if the weight of time had stooped him. He carried a long cane, gathered up toward his breast, in a hand that was a blue claw, entirely unfleshed. He stamped his cane upon the floor. Age had stiffened his neck, but his eyes, for that reason, roved the more keenly. "'I told you before,' he said, "'that I ain't going to have noise in the evening. Evening is my time for reading. Evening is my time for quiet. I ain't going to have noise. I heard a racket once before tonight, and now you're shouting.' it's got to stop do you hear it's got to stop he whipped up his cane suddenly and shook it in malevolent rage at gus you lout you fool he exclaimed it's you that makes life a torture round here now mind you no more noise to the surprise of montaigne this fierce reproof was received in a mild silence both the woman and her son lowered their eyes to the floor and then gus looked up in apology I i'm sure sorry he said i got to arguing and that's the trouble with fools said the terrible old man they always talk too much who's this he picked out jack montaigne with a gesture of his cane a stranger said the woman that we never seen before but we can't turn folks away on nights like this we got to show some sort of kindness even if we ain't rich folks and even if we don't get paid she said this with a sort of cringing humility glancing sadly toward the ceiling, as if bewailing the ingratitude of a hard world. But the old man merely grunted and then grinned at her. "'You'll get a reward in heaven for all your kindness,' he told her. "'You sure will get a reward there. Who are you?' This last was directed at Montaigne. "'I'm Jack,' said Montaigne. "'Jack, eh?' said the old fellow. "'Jack the baker, Jack the butcher, Jack the rope-maker, Jack the killer. Which one are you?' and as he concluded the list of fanciful appellations his narrow chin thrust out and his keen eyes probed and stabbed at the eyes of jack montaigne in spite of himself montaigne felt a chill running through his veins the old man knew too much about human nature and all his knowledge seemed to be of evil i don't like him went on the old man send him away i'd have nightmares all night if i knew that man was sleeping here under the same roof with me I don't like him. He's too hungry. Them that have nothing want everything, and him, he ain't got a cent in your pocket. As he said this, he advanced a long step, a light and stealthy step, and thrust his cane almost in the face of Jack. The latter half rose from his chair, alarmed, and filled with an almost superstitious fear. The old man began to laugh mirthlessly, his eyes snapping. Then he stamped his cane on the floor as he stepped back i know you he went on nodding to himself i know you all starvelings buzzards blah you'll find no meat on my bones to fatten you not you out with you jack the beggar jack the knave jack the killer out with you and sleep in the barn i'll not have you under the same roof with me i say i prophesy you won't come to no good end jack montaigne slowly recovered his poise in the face of this malignant attack he settled back again in his chair and smiled in the wicked face of the old man. "'I'll stay here,' he said, old bones. "'I'll stay here and be comfortable. It ain't none too warm outside.' "'You won't leave, won't you?' demanded the hostile old ogre. "'You can't throw him out, can you?' he asked of Gus. Then he answered his own question. "'No, I've been taking ten like you to handle one like him. But if I was forty years younger, I'd—' "'Well, no matter.' Forty years are forty years, and can't be changed. "'Mr. Benton,' broke in the woman, "'I'm terribly sorry. I sure am. I do what I can to make you comfortable, but when gents come and force their way in on me—' 
i thought you took him in out of kindness the irritable old man fairly snapped his question don't talk mrs zeller don't talk i see through you and i don't see no good he turned on gus by the way seen young walters lately seen him this morning mr benton you did eh? and what'd he say he's doing fine says he'll have his interest money ready for you next week he can pay it now the old fellow nodded his head slowly back and forth half closing his eyes i knowed walters would be made by the money i loaned him i knowed that i always know and right here mr benton said the woman i could have used that money fine me and gus could have improved the ranch no end and give you a better rate of interest than walters does don't talk declared the octogenarian don't talk i see through you like you had a window over where your heart is he turned and stalked toward the door his back was visibly pinched and withered under his coat from that rear view he seemed suddenly weak but when he turned on them again at the door all thought of his feebleness left jack montaigne the withered lips of mr benton continued to writhe but he uttered no sound presently his halting step went up the stairs again and disappeared through a doorway beyond when he had gone there was a sigh emitted by all three for a moment exchanging glances they seemed to be of one mind truly they were all in differing ways grim people but compared with this terrible old man they were weaklings that bed i told you about said gus suddenly i'll show you where the room is if you like jack montaigne nodded rose and followed his guide up the stairs noting the empty bareness of the house desolate spending which had impoverished the ranch had gutted the house it seemed the very hall seemed to beg for new voices and cheerier footfalls certainly less stealthy ones when they came to the room gus deposited the lamp on the table beside the bed and left without a word jack montaigne sat down and buried his face in his hands he had come to another halting place in his downward progress through life had the old man been right was he indeed bound for damnation he shrugged away that fierce prophecy in the meantime the fact was that he needed money needed it terribly must have it and the old fellow beyond doubt possessed what he wanted had he not heard the two in the kitchen speak of money and a chest all was as clear as day the old usurer kept a store of coin in his room and loaned it out about the countryside End of chapter two chapters three and four of sheriff larrabee's prisoner by martin dexter pseudonym for max brand this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 3. Larrabee Listens The sheriff, Henry Larrabee, jerked up his head and listened. That phone call is for me, he said instantly, as the first ring ended. Two long and three shorts was the sheriff's ring on that country line, and the ring was ground out on a little crank, without summoning the assistance of a central this first long ring was made in what might have been called a breathless fashion the crank turning so swiftly in the middle of the motion that it produced only a rattle not a true ring not for you not on a night like this exclaimed his wife as the good woman lifted her head and listened to the crashing of the rain against the roof a second long ring had begun it's for me right enough said the sheriff and rose to his feet his daughter mary rose also staring with excitement oh dad what could be happening on a night like this anything oh, there it goes the second long ring had ended and there followed three short rings in swift succession the sheriff ran to the phone with great strides hello he called sheriff larrabee said a woman's voice come quick for there's been a murder here who are you mrs zeller murder ah the last word was a half scream and there was the sound of the telephone receiver dropping with a jerk you devil the sheriff heard a man's voice shouting larrabee smashed up his own receiver judd he thundered chris his two sons answered with shouts from the upper part of the house 
Come down to me quick. We got riding to do. Henry breathed his wife, stammering with fear, as she ran to him. What is it? Where? Nothing, he answered sternly. Don't hang on to me. I got work, that's all. When I'm gone, call the Gloucester house and get the Gloucester boys to ride toward the Zeller place as fast as they can saddle and get under way. I'll meet em on the road. That's all. Don't ask questions. Just do what I say. Catching up his hat, he plunged from the house, the front door banging heavily behind him, at the same time that the thunder of his son's feet began on the stairs above. Within five minutes they were in the saddle and racing out onto the muddy road, for they kept their horses in a shed near the house, ready for quick saddling at any hour of the day or night. Going up the first steep hill, they could talk. "'I knew,' said Judd, "'that there'd be trouble some day at the Zeller house. What's up?' i don't know answered the father just heard a woman talkin and woman talk don't mean much usually but it sure sounded like trouble was busted loose come on lads they had reached the crest of the hill and now they lurched down into the valley at a reckless gallop the horses sliding and slipping over the mud turning down the valley road they presently came in view of a fire beneath a tree and the sheriff headed straight for it he swung out of the saddle in front of the tramp whom Jack Montaigne had seen earlier in the night. The tramp straightened up. He had been dozing, with his head almost dropped into the flame of the fire, and blinked at the new arrivals. The stern hand of the sheriff helped him to his feet, and he stifled his yawn. "'Who are you?' asked the sheriff. "'Slim,' said the tramp. "'Some call me Mississippi Slim.' "'What else?' "'This remember being called any other name.' "'You come with me, Mississippi Slim. Judd, take him along and follow me to the Zeller place. This is the kind of know things, this Slim. Chris, come with me. We got to ride hard.' "'What can you get out of Slim?' asked Chris, as the two spurred on through the mud. "'Never can tell. But if you ever step into my boots, boy, and get my job, you want to pick up them that look like Slim. If there's trouble around, they're most always downwind from it, and they know all about what's going on.' They smell it before they see it, and they see it before us ordinary folks dream it. He concluded with a brief admonition. If Gus Zeller is mixed up in this killin', or whatever it is, that we're movin' toward, and we come across him armed, don't waste no time arguin'. If he shows fight, shoot, and shoot to kill. Handle him the way you'd handle a dog. He ain't no better much. He had no chance to say more, for now they came to the house, where lights were burning in half of the windows. The sheriff's son was for a careful approach. The sheriff, however, scoffed at such an idea, and advancing to the kitchen door he cast it open and stepped into the presence of Gus Zeller and his mother. There was no need to fear Gus Zeller. He was a white-faced, trembling wreck of a man, shrinking against the wall. His mother was ten times more formidable. Her eyes were gleaming, her hands clenched, and her whole attitude that of one ready to fight a great battle. "'You sure come slow,' she said to Larrabee. "'Come upstairs, and you'll find it.' There was something so ominous in that last syllable that even the sheriff, time-hardened by contact with crime and criminals, was a trifle shocked. As she took up the lamp, he swung in behind her, first ordering Gus Zeller to follow close to his mother. The order threw Gus into a sudden panic. "'But what have I got to do with it?' he asked tremulously. "'I didn't do it. I swear I didn't do it, Sheriff.' "'I'm not saying you did,' said the Sheriff, disgusted by such cringing. "'But you step along. I want to keep you under my eye.' Gus skulked into line, glancing fearfully behind, as if anticipating a kick. They hurried up the stairs, the woman exclaiming eagerly, "'You got to hurry, Sheriff. He left in a rush, and he'll be riding like a fiend all night. Every minute counts when you're trailing a gent like him.' "'Like who?' asked the Sheriff. "'I'll tell you about him after you see what he's done.' They had hurried up to the floor of the second story of the house, and now they went straight behind Mrs. Zeller into the room, directly opposite the head of the stairs. They passed through a broken door. It had been splintered exactly in the center, and both halves were still attached, the one by its hinges and the other by the lock. Mrs. Zeller placed the lamp on the table near the center of the room. There, she exclaimed dramatically, stepping back, nothing ain't been touched. There you are. They looked past her and saw, within the bright circle cast by the lamp, the figure of old Mr. Benton lying on his back. 
both hands were caught up to his breast and he lay in a crimson pool that had run from a great wound in his head the sheriff's son gasped turned sick and caught at the wall for support but the sheriff himself showed not the slightest emotion he merely leaned over the body saying never knowed he was that tall never saw the old codger straightened out before now you've seen said mrs zeller shrilly and now go get him how long ago did he leave only forty minutes by the clock i've been watchin for you to come and watchin the clock and thinkin you'd never come but he ain't that far through the mud forty minutes asked the sheriff and he suddenly lost all eagerness well let's hear about this get over here will you the last words were a savage roar and they jerked gus away from the door toward which he had been sneaking he stood back against the wall shuddering and his eyes twitched nervously from face to face there ain't no call to talk to gus like that said mrs zeller he didn't do nothing perhaps not said the sheriff and maintaining his aggravating calm he produced a cut of chewing tobacco and worked off a comfortable bite between his front teeth say dad broke in his son you ain't going to stand around while he gets away you talk less and listen more said his father sagely and you cotton on to this before you start following a trail find out where it leads now mrs zeller what happened he came here and, and made us began the woman who's he wouldn't give no name that kind never do just said it was jack but mr benton knew right off the minute he laid eyes on him that jack was no good and he said so right to his face well jack come and knocked open our kitchen door and asked for a meal and a bed i didn't like the looks of him but when i told him there weren't nothing for him here he pulled a gun and started ordering us around ain't that right gus every single word said the truthful gus rolling his eyes leave gus out and talk to me afterward mr benton come down like he mostly always does to say a word or two to us before he goes to bed him knowing that we're about the only friends he has in the world the sheriff was now walking around the room carelessly examining every corner of it mrs zeller followed him a pace or two in every direction he took raising her voice when he was far away lowering it slightly when he was close he seen jack as i was saying and jack seen him and while benton was talking jack found out that the old man kept a pile of money in his chest in his room you knew that did you asked the sheriff his back turned does it mean anything my knowing it asked mrs zeller go on finally after mr benton left and jack got through eatin he ate like he hadn't had food for a couple of days jack went up to bed and he wouldn't be suited with nothing but gus's own room right next to mr benton's room gus come downstairs afterwards i don't like the look to him says gus nor his ways says i i'm going to sit up a while says gus till jack turns out his light so we done it we turned down the lamp in the kitchen so it didn't make no light just a uh, glooming through the room then we waited and waited all at once we heard a scream quick as a flash gus jumps to his feet i've been waiting for just that he said and starts running up the stairs with me after him are you sure he went first asked the sheriff sure he did ain't he the man of the house mm, go on said larrabee dryly gus tried the door and it was locked he took a run and broke the door open you see and there he found mr benton lying poor soul with the chest open and the papers gone and everything all ruffled up just the way you see nothing ain't been touched not a thing is touched Sheriff, since we first seen it the chest in the corner of the room indeed was open and a confusion of papers tumbled in it and on the floor around it and then the door of jack's room opens and out he comes rubbing his eyes like he'd just waked up as though he could have slept through all that noise what's all the racket about he says well he knew the murderer look here she led the way to the window below it was the roof of the veranda that wound around the side of the house opposite was another window that window yonder opens into jack's room where he was supposed to sleep the liar what he done was to slip out of that window of his room and walk right across the roof and open this window and come in he had first throttled the old man you see she advanced to the body and leaning about it pointed to some discolorations on the throat there was something hideous in this eagerness something unnatural for her sex 
she was giving the scent of jack montaigne to the bloodhounds but the old boy died hard went on mrs zeller stepping back again he wasn't dead when jack finished the throttling he come to life got his breath and let out the screech that i heard down below and near stopped my heart beatin the sheriff in the meantime went to the window leading on to the roof and tried it it opened frictionlessly and without sound under the lift of his hand he turned nodding and marked the last of mrs zeller's words with more apparent interest and when he screeched jack who was getting the money out of the chest turned round and hit him over the head with a chunk of wood from the fireplace there it is by the open hearth of the fireplace there was a pile of cut wood each piece well over two feet in length but one of these pieces lay in the middle of the floor an ugly stain splotched about its sharp edge you sure he got the money asked the sheriff there ain't a cent in the chest she exclaimed look for yourself the way i done i thought you didn't touch anything he asked sharply are you gonna lay the stealin on me what did jack do then asked the sheriff when he seen the body he tried to act surprised but me and gus drew back and looked at him he tried to talk the thing off but we just kept lookin pretty soon he run out of the room next thing we knew he was jumpin downstairs he didn't hit more'n twice all the way to the bottom outdoors he went and the next minute he was tearin down the road on his hoss riding west thanks said the sheriff what did he look like good looking but mean about five eleven dark straight looking eyes dark hair about thirty years old or less gray around the temples rides a gray hoss gus went out and seen it in the barn after jack went to bed or after he was in his room that's all i can think about except that he looked like a killer mr benton said so right to his face hmm said the sheriff and raised his eyebrows wait a minute he added here comes the boys chapter four larrabee wins his bet he went to the door and called down there was a sound of horses snorting in the rainfall outside and presently a cluster of five men climbed the stairs in answer to the call the three gloucester boys came first they had answered with all speed the summons from the house of the sheriff behind them came mississippi slim with his guard the sheriff greeted the gloucester boys with a word of thanks for their promptness we got a bad ride ahead of us he said this is the work the gent we're after done he pointed to the body of benton and the man that done it had taken the west road we'll start right away chris you stay here and keep everybody out of this room now wait a minute he turned and eyed mississippi slim the latter was moving stealthily about the room with his head thrust forward and bent low he was oddly like a sniffing dog slim called the sheriff slim whirled as if at the sound of a shot he had been leaning over the chest full of papers you had your fire near the road see anybody passin tonight slim raised one finger what was he like bad lookin on a gray hoss know anything about him no nope. did he say anything nothin much talk out slim what did he say asked me why i didn't come down here and get a hand out in a bed i said it couldn't be done cause the lady don't waste no time on gents that was wandering on the road looking for work here mrs zeller snorted her contempt but this gent on the gray hoss allowed as he'd get a hand out in the bunk said he'd see if he couldn't get treated right did he come on to this house then i don't know you didn't follow him follow him let my fire go out slim shook his head in wonder at such a thought the sheriff turned on gus that door was locked when you came up yep sure was and i busted it in he said defiantly ask ma if i didn't where's the key i don't know i didn't look for it look on the floor said the sheriff himself joining the search whether that door was locked from the inside or the outside makes a pile of difference the floor of the hall and the floor of the room revealed no key the sheriff desisted from the search and gave his final directions you stay here chris and you hold slim why asked slim what i got to do with all this killin you're a material witness you'll get chuck and a free bunk ain't that good enough for you we got good enough bunks to suit anybody in the jail jail slim exclaimed his rat eyes jerked from face to face and then became fixed on the floor while a violent shiver ran through his meager body but he said no more 
and get in touch with the coroner tell him to get his men down here first thing went on the sheriff to chris we'll hit the trail boys now that he's clean gone put in mrs zeller malevolently the sheriff turned on her with a mild and curious glance but the effect of it was to make her wince and change color then the men passed on out of the room the gloucester boys pete and bob and jerry were first in the saddle with judd larrabee and his father following after but as the former started down the road to the west the sheriff called him back where are you going he asked why follow the trail i guess you think he went that way why not if he's got any sense at all he knows that mrs zeller's seen the way he started and the first thing he'll do is to switch off which way then what'd you see asked the sheriff look around through the rain what'd you see the storm had fallen away to a faint misting but still it blanketed the landscape indeed nothing could have been visible had it not been for the high riding moon that was itself unseen but served to outline the rain clouds in varying shades of deep gray and black don't see nothing said the sheriff's son except the mountains yonder i can just make em out then said the sheriff complacently that's where he's gone and we'll go the same way chris his other son came a pace closer start using that telephone said his father get boontown and tell the central there to spread the description of jack around get old miller in boontown too and tell him to get to work talkin that's the best thing he does anyway good-bye boy once under way he made up for his seeming inactivity in the house of the zellers he was a heavier weight than the younger men, and his horse, an old buckskin campaigner, was inferior in speed to the mount of the rest, and yet, before they had gone half a mile, the sheriff was in the lead, pushing his horse along with such skill that it seemed he could sense through the dark the obstacles that came in his way. Where the others floundered six times, the wise-footed buckskin slipped once the first excitement wore off with the posse too but the sheriff seemed to be spurred on by a steady and unflagging interest that kept his head high and his eyes straining on through the dark the gray of dawn which found them in the foothills following trails that began to wind with the contours of the land discovered the sheriff as agile of eye as ever and cheerfully examining the hills and the trees as they passed along the others awakened also as the day began a freshening north wind chopped the sheeted storm clouds into thin drifts that served to shut the sun out but allowed most of its light to sift through in this invigorating air the sleepless quintet kept on until presently the sheriff raised his hand now he said i figure it's about time for us to look about his followers had been very prone to beat up every thicket along the way and they were quite disgusted by the careless methods of their guide and leader to their minds a thousand men might have hidden along the way and laughed as the posse went by on a wild goose chase the sheriff had chosen to stop on the top of a bare hill with a bare country all around him why waste time here they conveyed their ideas bluntly and immodestly the more so since the sheriff scratched the stubble on his chin a far-away look in his eyes while they talked and seemed to be almost persuaded at every other word what he said at length was are you hungry boys sure was the chorus so's jack said the sheriff his followers glanced at one another in disgust and judd larrabee flushed with shame certainly the old man was growing old and simple he glared defiantly at the gloucester boys but it certainly was a very foolish remark this reference to the appetite of jack what had that to do with a man-hunt the appetite of the hunted he's hungry said the leader and most like he smelled the bacon coming up in smoke yonder there was three or four streaks of smoke in view very dimly perceptible against the gray of the sky nothing like the sight of smoke to make a gent uncommon hungry went on the sheriff let's start on urged his son uncomfortably we can talk on the way on the way to what asked his father gently let's make that out first that's what i'd like to know burst out judd looks to me like we're all wrong who'd ride this way clean out into the open if he was hunting shelter 
maybe he wouldn't said the sheriff it's just my guess but if you don't do no guessin you don't catch no men at the end of the trail i figure jack pictures us ridin hard along the west trail he's come up here to the hills he's got a lot of hours ahead of us he's thinkin so he comes over the hill here with a ragin tearin hunger and he can't help stoppin to eat now first thing is where'd he go to eat there's the biggest smoke yonder said judd very miserable but striving to seem as if he took his father seriously all the time he was wretchedly conscious of the smiles of the gloucester boys that's the biggest smoke admitted the sheriff and that's the one he wouldn't go to that little house over the hill would be the place that a gent would run for unless he was professional and had done murders before ain't that just what he is asked pete gloucester ain't that what benton called him at sight a murderer no he called jack a killer there's a pile of difference jack's an amateur what sure he turned his trick before he made sure the other folks was in bed he took a room in the house when he could have pretended he had to keep on his way and so he could have ridden off and come back and done the job with nobody knowing nope jack's an amateur killers don't pick out old men jack needed money and needed it bad he started to get it he choked the old man not with no pleasure but because it had to be done and then when the old boy screeched he picked up a piece of wood and batted him over the head that was just plain clumsy why a professional wouldn't have trusted to choking he'd have used a touch of the knife nothing like a knife for neat silent work and dead men don't come back to life and start hollering so i think jack's an amateur for that and other reasons and being an amateur i'll just lay you boys even that he's in that little old house over the hills yonder or has been there i'll take it for twenty said jerry gloucester instantly and me chimed in pete and bob then the cavalcade started forward at a gallop toward the house they dipped over the hill and came upon a wretched little cottage leaning up the slope a woman came to the door at their call wiping her hands on her apron mornin called the sheriff we're trying to catch up with our pal that gent on the gray hoss that was here a while back which way did he go right on over the hill there she answered pointing funny he didn't say nothing about the rest of you coming along though oh, we got a surprise party for him in a way of speaking said the sheriff how long ago did he start mm, about half an hour thanks with a glance the sheriff gathered up his posse and they started on the silence behind henry larrabee was a tremendous thing it set him smiling as he rode to the top of that hill to which the woman had pointed there he drew rein again below lower hills tumbled this way and that but the landscape was empty of all signs of a rider by the way said the sheriff that bet we made a while back i forgot that i don't bet that way i sure ain't going to be let off that easy said pete gloucester generously i was getting to think that i knowed more'n you sheriff and i'm getting off cheap at twenty dollars worth besides why don't you bet it don't pay somehow said the sheriff to win money out of the life of another man even if he's a murderer End of chapter four Chapters 5 and 6 of Sheriff Larrabee's Prisoner by Martin Dexter, pseudonym for Max Brand. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 5 Left in the Rain There was no chance for further argument or comment on the sheriff's ideas. Not half a mile away, climbing out of a hollow and slowly mounting the hillside beyond, they saw a rider passing on a gray horse without a word even of exultation the posse lurched down the hillside it was like the sudden breaking of a storm this coming on the trail of the fugitive after the meeting with the woman in the house to his young companions the quiet-mannered sheriff seemed suddenly a prophet a man of mysterious foreknowledge it was unquestionably the man they wanted no sooner had he sighted the riders on the far slope then he leaned far forward over the saddle and urged his weary horse to fresh efforts scurrying rapidly up the hill tired his horse must be but he had come the distance from the zeller house at a far slower gait than the sheriff and accordingly his mount had greater reserves of energy 
he shot out of sight over the crest and when the sheriff and his men reached the same point they saw jack montaigne halfway up the farther slope in spite of their frantic spurring he had gained on them and he was still gaining he'll run us into the ground said the sheriff i'll see if i can't tag him then he whipped the long rifle out of its case tucked the butt into the hollow of his shoulder and fired the fugitive and his horse were flattened to the slope beyond as if a great weight falling from above had crushed them while the sheriff calmly tucked his gun back into the case his posse rushed forward with a yell they had their man still it seemed that jack montaigne would flee blindly pitting his speed of foot against the speed of galloping horses yet there was nothing to which he could flee the hills were piteously bare and there was not a tree only scatterings of rocks here and there yet he raced to the top of the hill and disappeared beyond it a moment later the object of his flight appeared he had run for the rocks of the summit in order to use them as a fort and now he opened fire with the rifle which he had taken from the saddle when his horse fell suddenly the sheriff drew rein with an oath and the oath caused his companions to pull up their own mounts for the sheriff was not a profane man look said the sheriff as the echo of the first shot died away he put his hoss out of its misery instead of trying to pot us the gray horse had straightened out on the slope and now no longer struggled while the horseman stared the rifle spoke again three times not three yards away from the sheriff's horse the bullets thudded into the mud and all three landed within the compass of a man's arm he's warning us back said the sheriff with another oath i told you he was an amateur murderer if he can shoot like that them three shots might a knocked three of us off our hosses but he ain't going to shoot to kill unless he has to that's his way of saying it such seemed to be the only explanation that's what i call politeness went on the sheriff but the law don't make no allowances for such things that gent yonder had done a murder and he's got the hang for it judd skirt around to the right and get behind him pete you go to the left bob and jerry ride back to the top of the hill and get down behind them rocks i'm going to try a little politeness of my own his directions were swiftly followed Judd Larrabee and P. Gloucester, riding left and right, scurried off for the positions that had been assigned them, thereby placing Jack Montaigne in the center of a circle of foes. Three or four times as they rode, the fugitive fired, but each time the bullet struck a few feet in front of the running horse. The sheriff turned straight to the right, disappeared for ten minutes, and came in view again at the top of a tall, steep-sided hill which overlooked the fortress of Montaigne. Here the sheriff dismounted, ensconced himself on the crest, and placed himself flat on his stomach with his rifle ready, his slicker keeping him out of the mud. From his position, only exposing the top of his head to the fugitive, he could look down on Jack and hold the latter at his mercy and mercy the sheriff intended to show if he could he saw jack montaigne in the center of a number of low-lying rocks among which he stirred about keeping a strict lookout on all sides the sheriff drew out his glass and focused it carefully until he could see the face of the man distinctly what he saw was of sufficient interest to keep him motionless for some time but he knew that appearances are not half the story the man had committed murder he kept telling himself over and over and yet in spite of himself the sheriff's heart was weakening the generosity which had induced the fellow to end the suffering of his wounded horse with his first shot instead of directing that bullet against the charging posse and the manner in which his rifle had been used merely to warn the sheriff and his men away these things struck directly to the heart of henry larrabee he had had many a gruesome experience with outlaws and killers, but never before had he trailed a murderer who would not shoot to kill. Moreover, the consummate marksmanship of the man appealed to him. It was hard to believe that such an artist could have been guilty of the foul crime in the Zeller house. But facts were facts. The sheriff, warned by the stinging impact of a drop of rain that he had not much time in which to work, gathered the butt of his gun closer and prepared to fire 
montaigne was surrounded by rocks which would serve admirably to protect him from direct fire on the level but there was none of sufficient height to protect him the angling fire of the sheriff in his commanding position moreover jack montaigne was hopelessly surrounded pete gloucester to the northeast bob and jerry to the south they lay in a loose circle round the central position sooner or later the fugitive would be starved into submission there was only one chance for his escape and that was in a driving rainstorm which might blot him out of sight and give him freedom to slip through but the sheriff had a way of forestalling the storm that was now blowing again out of the north he took careful aim and with exquisite nicety that would have done justice to montaigne's own skill with a gun planted a shot on the rock just beyond the fugitive that warning ought to be sufficient to make the fellow see that his position was commanded and that he would have to come out and surrender unless he wished to be shot as he lay there larrabee laid aside his rifle and took up the glass minutely to observe the results of the shot he saw that montaigne had sprung up and was busying himself in a strange fashion tugging at another deep buried rock just before him the sheriff gazed and wondered what this might mean until with a supreme wrench he saw the stone torn from its bed then he understood with a shout of vexation he dropped the glass and snatched up the rifle again but it was too late before he could draw the bead the second rock had been placed on the first a herculean feat of strength and now the two stones made a perfect safe shelter against the bullets of the sheriff even in his commanding position larrabee ground his teeth after all he had been a fool not to kill this man on the first sight now he looked anxiously to the north but what he saw was greatly reassuring the storm clouds were piling high but along the horizon a rift had appeared rain was falling steadily and heavier rain was coming but it was obviously only a clearing off shower and the heart of it would pass over in a few moments nearer and nearer came the sheet of rain blotting out the whole north and consuming hill after hill in obscurity as it swept along now he could no longer see the hill where judd lay and suddenly the storm struck his own position in thirty seconds he could not see ten yards before him or behind so terrific was the downpour unquestionably jack would attempt to break through the circle but before he travelled a quarter of a mile the storm would have passed and he would be in clear view and rifle range point blank sweeping his slicker about him and sheltering the rifle under it the sheriff waited probing the heart of the downpour in case the fellow should attempt to slip past close beside him but that was not likely he would run down through one of the hollows between the hills and never risk meeting with the members of the posse still the rain continued unabating in the sheriff's anxiety it seemed to him impossible that so much water could ever have been drawn up into the atmosphere but still it poured down moment after precious moment until at last he saw a gradual brightening to the north and the hill where judd lay came into view again like a ghost it was at this moment that his horse snorted and the sheriff turned with an appeasing word to see the figure of a man rushing straight on him from behind there was no time to handle a rifle as the man drew out of the dense rain a set savage face came into view larrabee went for his revolver it stuck in the holster the rain had got into the leather so that it was glued for a moment to the gun and when the weapon came into his hand the other was upon him the sheriff dodged and fired but as his finger curled around the trigger a long arm darted forth a fist gleamed before him and the blow landed flush on the point of his jaw it did not knock him down but it paralyzed both brain and body as he staggered back the revolver fell from his nerveless hand and the next instant he was swept to the muddy ground in the embrace of bear-like arms what followed was done with lightning speed and precision in the space of half a dozen breaths the sheriff found himself trussed securely hand and foot gagged and lying on his back with the merciless rain whipping down into his face 
the fugitive gave him hardly a glance but caught up the fallen sombrero flung it over the face of his victim to shelter him from the torrent and with this final and almost insulting act of grace he was gone the splashing of the departing hoofs came back to larrabee his destined victim was galloping off on his own horse that tale would be caught up and told and retold by a hundred tongues in his anguish sheriff larrabee wished that he had died before this day ever came to him death was the final meed of every man but shame should come to cowards only the rain diminished now as if like a traitor it only wished to endure until jack montaigne had used its shelter to escape a moment later the brightness of the sun was about him but when would they find him and set him free how long before they rode again on the trail of that hard-fisted slippery devil how long chapter six all aboard two days later the joyless eyes of jack montaigne looked down from the side of a foothill upon a streak of black hurrying across the valley with a trailing cloud of white drawn out above it montaigne drew a great breath of relief he looked back instinctively toward the mountains rolling huge and sullen above him as if he expected them to put forth an arm and catch him back after all the perils he had escaped and come to easy striking distance of the railroad and the railroad meant freedom in a few days it could carry him away to the ends of the country where the names of zeller and benton were never dreamed of he visualized himself in a far-off city reading an obscure notice in an obscure paper about the futile hunt for jack montaigne wanted for murder for by this time they had surely hunted back to the town of his origin and there they had learned that other and shameful story and his name with it he bowed his head at the thought of it then he shrugged back his shoulders and started his pony down the mountainside and toward the rambling collection of houses in the distance two miles from the outskirts he came to a pleasant meadow where a brook tumbled brightly in the sunshine here he dismounted took off the saddle and bridle and waved the horse away to freedom the invitation was accepted with a snort and a flirt of the heels for a moment montaigne watched with a sigh and then turned back to take up his trail he so timed his approach that he reached the vicinity of the town at dusk and then skirted about it to the railroad of course it would not do to linger near the station but that would not be necessary hardly a mile away the tracks started a stiff grade where a freight train would have to labor slowly so slowly that a man agile of foot and sure of hand could certainly take it with ease to this point he went and selecting a shelter between two bushes that would shelter him from the too active eye of some brakey as the train approached he sat down to wait the moon rose during his vigil before he heard a far-off humming on the tracks and then made out a train stopping at the town and starting again that it was a freight train he had not the slightest doubt as soon as he heard the redoubled labor of the engine as it reached the grade montaigne rose stretched himself and finding all his muscles playing smoothly in spite of the long period of inactivity crouched again between the bushes and watched the train roar nearer the sound grew louder the humming of the rails was now a heavy vibration the rush of the exhaust was like the deafening noise of a great waterfall with his brain reeling from the uproar the blow fell that had been so long avoided there was a sharp command from behind and he wheeled to look into the muzzles of three revolvers held by grim-faced men it is said that remembered dreams are those which occur during the very act of waking the mind unencumbered by the slow processes of the senses that burden it during waking moments plunges through enough events to fill a lifetime all crammed into a second or two of actual time and so it was with jack montaigne as he faced the leveled guns and calculated the chances there was not a line on a single face that he overlooked had there been a single symptom of weakness in a single face he would have taken the suicidal chance rather than submit but there was no weakness 
every eye told him the same story a readiness to kill on the slightest provocation on his part so he pushed his hands above his head to those who held him up it seemed that the gesture of surrender was made instantly suffering cows exclaimed jack montaigne to the sheriff recognizing his antagonist whom he had met during the rainstorm is it possible that you've trailed me here trailed asked the sheriff gently not a bit i just did a little guessing that you'd come over the mountains in this direction and if you did you'd be sure to head for this town and if you headed for this town you'd be sure to strike for this grade to grab a freight all simple as daylight go through him judd the last was addressed to his son who now adroitly went through the pockets of jack the revolver the pocket-knife tobacco and brown papers and a square of sulphur matches was the total of the effects of jack montaigne he's cashed the money somewheres said judd ain't any sign of it sure he's cashed it said the sheriff any fool would do that considering how much there is of it where'd you put it jack he asked casually of course anything you say to us may be used against you i know said montaigne so i won't say anything about the money and he smiled at the sheriff with what might have been resignation or mockery larrabee considered that smile with the most intimate attention bring down your hands he said but bring em down behind you then keep movin slow afraid i got another gun tucked up my sleeve asked montaigne i'm afraid of you every minute replied the sheriff with astounding frankness i might as well tell you so you'll know that i'm on the watch for you every minute come to think of it we'll handcuff your hands in front of you here you go as montaigne obediently offered his wrists the manacles were snapped over them a nice new pair observed montaigne calmly looking down at them his quiet manner shocked the younger men of the posse but the sheriff seemed more and more interested in his victim what did you do with my hoss he asked i suppose you knew we'd sent descriptions of the hoss all over together with descriptions of you did you drill her through the head and let her tumble down a ravine some place i let the hoss run loose said montaigne just above town yonder i take that kind of you said the sheriff gently i take that mighty kind all right boys jump on your hosses and we'll start climb on this one jack montaigne hesitated you going to walk sheriff i can do it better than you ain't handy to walk when you can't swing your hands it was strange to hear these politely diplomatic moves between the two presently montaigne was seated on the horse and they started back for the town with the sheriff walking a little behind the captive suddenly he drew up beside his prisoner jack he said in a purely conversational tone why did you do it do what asked montaigne out of a dream the old boy old benton why'd you finish him you're a pretty good guesser answered montaigne without emotion suppose you try to figure this puzzle out so the matter was allowed to rest they took a midnight train out and in the dawn they arrived at the sheriff's county seat where montaigne was escorted to the jail he preserved his careless demeanor throughout even when the front door of the jail slammed heavily behind him when they reached the door of the cell designated for jack the sheriff drew forth his bunch of keys just hold on to your patience for a while he said to jack take me a while to find the right key you don't need one answered montaigne here you are and holding his hands small he slipped them deftly out of the handcuffs the sheriff watched with intense interest you could have done that any time and made a play to get loose he observed why didn't you jack i know you got plenty of nerve for a break because i've made my play and finished it i'm beat sheriff and that's all there is to it then he walked calmly into the barred enclosure End of chapter six chapters seven and eight of sheriff larrabee's a prisoner by martin dexter pseudonym for max brand this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 7 Public Opinion Boontown, the county seat, was so small that the uninitiated were apt to call it a village, but it was not too small to be without that mysterious and uncontrollable voice usually called public opinion. 
public opinion on this occasion was wakening from a long long sleep for some years public opinion had expressed itself only at elections and similar unimportant and formal functions but when the news arrived that the murderer of old benton was in town and in jail the man whom the district attorney had arraigned beforehand with terrible eloquence in the little boontown newspaper public opinion wakened with a start yawned forth a growl from some four hundred throats and stretched its thousand arms to find something on which to vent its rage for public opinion is a blind beast even when it wakens the maladministration of officials the legal cruelties of business oppression and business betrayals are very apt never to reach the sleepy ear of the creature but it may suddenly start up to yell itself hoarse with applause because a politician gives birth to a neat phrase then it falls asleep with a grunt and a smile when the lucky fellow bows his thanks and dips his finger in the public purse this great stupid beast public opinion having long slumbered in boontown now roused itself with a roar and called for a victim and on this occasion there was some justification for noise the district attorney had called attention to the brutality of the crime to the youth of the murderer to the white-haired feebleness of the murdered man finally the district attorney had declared his intention of suppressing such crimes of ending the reign of violence in that violent county of bringing in a golden age of peace by hanging this red-handed devil called jack from the highest gallows a good beginning he pointed out was nine-tenths of a good ending and a good example was the better part of a good beginning the broken neck of jack was to furnish the good example that would thereafter make crime hang its head and slink away from the precincts favored by the presence of the district attorney it may be gathered that he was a very young man to hold such a very old office fitzpatrick levine was one of those who loved the practice of criminal law and he loved the prosecuting end of it because he said that end was morally cleaner in reality his love for the attorney's office was like the love of the barbarian for the sword fitzpatrick levine liked to kill his summing up to a jury was delivered with both violence and relish he expanded his naturally meagre inches he became huge and dominated a courtroom while he was whipping a victim toward death he never recommended mercy to a judge on any occasion in appearance he was small rather plump with clear red cheeks a childishly smooth brow and eyes of sparkling brightness he was a favorite among ladies young and old among men he was highly prized for his contagious good cheer and his thrilling anecdotes generally about his own experiences because as he was fond of saying a man generally talks best about himself he was about twenty-seven years old but he seemed five full years short of that age and his youthful appearance was a tremendous advantage to him when with fiery indignation he assailed a criminal in the court the jury felt that so young a man with so smooth a brow must be filled with legal inspiration to use such violent words he spoke with a sort of indignant virtue that was wholly convincing he could make twelve honest men sway and stiffen with him and when he turned and shook his extended forefinger at the accused twelve pairs of eyes would generally turn and glare in the same direction no one would understand no one could be expected to understand that this apollo-faced man was consumed with a fanatical zeal to sacrifice a fellow-creature on the altar of justice fitzpatrick levine knelt at only one shrine this was his percentage of convictions he worshipped that god and he prayed to it he dreamed of a time when his picture would appear in some metropolitan newspaper setting forth the record of that brilliant young lawyer fitzpatrick levine but boontown did not act as levine's legal experience in other parts of the country had led him to suppose it would act no it rose up and seized guns and rushed to the jail and demanded that the murderer of old men should straightway be handed over to it to be torn limb from limb 
From a window of the hotel the young district attorney stared thoughtfully down upon this troubled sea before the jail. What oil could he throw upon the waters? Not that he cared for the life of Jack Montaigne, but Jack represented a sure conviction. If the mob rent him from limb to limb, a scalp that should hang at Fitzpatrick's belt would be gone. He went down and waded through the mob to the jail. Cries accompanied him. Give the skunk to us, Fitz. We'll teach him manners. Feed him out the window to us, Fitz. We'll teach him. Fitzpatrick Levine reached the door of the jail. Two pale-faced men with double-barreled shotguns guarded the prison, but they were not the force which held the mob at bay. That force the district attorney found in the office, a large quid of tobacco bulging his cheek, his heels cocked up on the desk. The sheriff rolled dull, contented eyes toward his visitors. "'Hello, Levine,' he said. "'Kind of noisy, ain't they?' Levine despised the sheriff, and the sheriff knew it. The sheriff despised Levine, and Levine knew it. Consequently, they were extremely amiable on all occasions. "'But,' said Levine, consternation in his face, "'aren't you going to do anything?' "'About what?' Fitzpatrick saw visions of the murderer torn from the jail, a conviction hopelessly lost. It was like a conspiracy, and the sheriff would not raise a hand. "'About the mob!' declared Fitzpatrick. "'Are you going to let him take him?' "'Take nothing,' replied the sheriff. "'They know me, son. If you don't like the noise, go out and quiet them. You started all this with your talk in the paper about white-haired innocence and youthful brutality.' "'Well,' said Levine, "'I only told the truth.' did you ever know benton not exactly well sir he was exactly a devil he didn't have one corner of a good deed tucked away in his make-up you can lay to that but there's your mob levine what are you going to do with it you're not afraid they'll get him then asked levine immensely relieved the sheriff laughed softly sooner than see them get him i'll arm the prisoner son but what could you two wait till you see him levine he's a man with him at my back well there ain't any use talking about it because the crowd ain't going to bust any doors down they'll just holler out there and have a good time if i get an earache i'll just go out and clear the street otherwise it don't amount to nothing levine walked to one side pondering as the sheriff had said he had raised the crowd what should he now do with it an idea leaped into that young and surprisingly fertile brain first he seized two officers of the law such as he usually liked to have with him on similar occasions they were both broad and correspondingly small of forehead and brain with them he went to the cell of the prisoner he waited outside until his two worthies had secured the arms of the prisoner with handcuffs then the district attorney led the way to a back room of the jail, a small room fenced in with almost soundproof walls. Here Jack Montaigne was seated near the wall, with an officer on either side. "'You heard that racket outside?' asked the district attorney, taking his stand with spread feet before the prisoner. "'And you know what it means?' "'They want me?' asked the prisoner, and yawned. The yawn startled Levine and he said ferociously they'll probably get you and you know what that means mm, tolerable well there's no use in talking said levine we can't afford to have the jail attacked and risk the lives of law-abiding citizens to protect a worthless dog like you there's only one thing that'll quiet that mob and that's to know that the law is going to finish you up in its own way in its own time there's only one way that the law can be absolutely sure of you and that's through a confession you understand montaigne nodded now said levine i don't mind telling you that you haven't a chance and you're going to hang everything is against you i could hang ten men on what i have against you it's only a matter of time and legal formalities which have to be gone through so the best thing for you all around is to let me have a full confession i can make things pretty miserable for you my friend if you hold out but if you talk out and tell the whole story i'll see that you live on the fat of the land up to the last day he smiled generously on his prisoner and went on besides there's no sense in this fool silence of yours you won't tell your name except to call yourself jack you won't give the name of the town you come from and all this is really evidence against you 
a man who is afraid to have the law know his past is a man the law handles without gloves will you talk jack i'll talk said jack montaigne the district attorney sighed with relief in another minute he had spread out a pad on his knee for shorthand was included in his accomplishments start in he said where your story begins to be different from what slim and the zellers have sworn to on a previous occasion he had listed all the sworn facts to jack in a vain effort to elicit a confession chapter eight levine learns a lesson well said jack montaigne that makes me begin at the beginning or pretty close to that mind you i don't expect you to believe me but i'm going to talk so's you'll stop bothering me start with when i got to the zeller house and make it brief it runs like this i didn't have a cent i had to get a place to sleep and i wanted chuck and i wanted it bad besides i hated skunks that would have turned a gent out into a storm like that so i made the zellers give me chuck while i was eatin the old man came in and called me a crook or words to that effect and right after that young zeller took me up and showed me into a room i was so sleepy i didn't take off my clothes i hit that bed and was off in a flash a scream woke me up i jumped out of my room and found a light shining under the door of benton's room i smashed that door when i found it was locked because inside that room i heard a scampering of feet when i ran in there was nobody there but old benton was lying dead the chest was open and the papers were ruffled a good deal i went downstairs and called mrs zeller and her kid they came up and looked then while i was talking to the kid mrs zeller sneaked out i went after her in a minute and i heard her telephoning the sheriff so i knew her plan was to send larrabee after me i was alone i knew that both the woman and gus would swear their lives away to stick me for the murder because that was their only way of taking suspicion off their own shoulders where it belongs what was my word against both of theirs i didn't wait i grabbed my hoss and started the sheriff followed you know the rest as he concluded fitzpatrick levine smashed the pad to the floor that's your confession is it yes by heaven i've a mind to let that mob in listen to em outside the crowd set up a fresh clamor surging toward the jail for half an hour the good men of boontown had been shouting to keep their anger alive shouting to find a leader i hear em said the prisoner and i'd a pile rather face them than face you and your crowd in the courtroom the lip of the district attorney curled he cast one glance at his henchman and they rose instantly to the occasion you skunk said the red-headed man at jack's right take this to teach you manners and he smashed his fist into montaigne's face the impact toppled man and chair he was jerked to his feet and the district attorney first making sure that the prisoner was securely pinioned on both sides stepped close and shook his fist under the nose of montaigne there's more of the same stuff coming for you he said unless you stop lying and tell the truth are you ready to talk it was only the beginning of the third degree it was only the beginning of that process which fitzpatrick levine loved above all else in the meantime he watched fascinated the progress of a crimson stain rolling down from the mouth of jack montaigne the stain was doubly red because montaigne had suddenly become deathly white at sight of that badge of fear the heart of the district attorney leaped with pleasure i've told you the truth he said and i ain't going to lie even to give you the pleasure of hanging me but don't have one of these gents hit me again in reply fitzpatrick levine smiled slowly as a connoisseur smiles when he inhales the bouquet of a favorite vintage he raised one finger and this time the black-haired man at montaigne's left acted his burly fist drove home with a sickening impact jack went down his head striking the wall he rolled forward on the floor and lay quiet pick him up said fitzpatrick levine i'll teach the dog to threaten me you heard him threaten me dick dick grinned and reaching down jerked montaigne up with one exertion of his burly arms but it was like lifting a wildcat montaigne came to his feet the handcuffs dangling from one wrist 
the sheriff very foolishly had neglected to warn his assistants about the great flexibility of those slender hands of jack and now his hands were free he swung the manacles into the face of dick and the black-haired man dropped without a cry then jack spun on his heel and smashed his right hand into the face of the redhead and sent that worthy crashing back against the wall the district attorney leaped for the door but between glancing over his shoulder in terror to see how long it might be before the danger assailed him from the rear and the shaking of his hand he could not lift the key into the lock of the door the redhead was battling with noble vigor and calling wildly on dick to come to his aid but his voice was choked and stifled in a rain of blows he got to his revolver only to have it kicked out of his hand it exploded as it fell on the far side of the room and the explosion drew a fresh shriek of amazing power from the district attorney at the same instant the red-headed fellow was back to the wall and the whipping fists of jack montaigne driven with uncanny speed and terrible power smashed his face until he cringed down moaning for quarter then jack montaigne turned on the district attorney the latter with one last despairing effort strove to get the key from the lock the key merely stuttered against the door and fitzpatrick levine fled to a corner here he crouched shielding his face with both arms no no he exclaimed don't i'll i'll see you go free i'll get you out you you, you don't come near me at that moment a hand turned the knob of the door from without and the prisoner worked his free hand deftly into the manacle the palm doubling to half its ordinary compass the sheriff opened the door to find jack montaigne leaning carelessly against the wall on the far side of the room his hands in irons dick lay with his face down unstirring and the red-headed man was just beginning to straighten up while the district attorney peered in terror between his arms as if through the bars of a cage kill him kill the devil fitzpatrick levine yelled he's tried to murder me he tried to murder us he's cut those handcuffs off and what demanded the sheriff sternly have you been doing with him in here what my office compels me to do trying to get a confession out of him and the devil how said the sheriff did he get his lip cut he attacked us began levine he attacked the three of you two of you with guns and him with none he started this game did he the sneer of the sheriff suddenly made it impossible for the glib tongue of the district attorney to wind itself around a plausible lie he could only moan i'll make him suffer for this i'll make him sorry for the day he was born look here said the sheriff staring mildly at the district attorney i guess i didn't see you kneeling over there in the corner and begging jack not to hit you i guess i didn't see nothing like that if i did i'd try to forget it but listen to me mr hang em quick levine if you lay a hand on him again i'll have to do a pile of remembering what's more i'll have you and your two thugs laughed out of town for yaller livered skunks which you are district attorney bah you ain't worthy of lickin the boots of jack maybe he's done a killin here and there but he's been a man according to my lights that's more in you and the two of them there can say now get out and don't come sneakin back to raise trouble here i'm runnin this jail and i'll keep on runnin it the two slipped without a word through the door dick was jerked to his feet kicked into semi-consciousness and pushed after them then the sheriff turning his back on the terrible man-killer asked him to follow and jack did follow very meekly back to his cell where the manacles were gravely unlocked and removed there the sheriff spoke to him for the first time i'm sorry he said that you got your lip all cut up he proceeded to the front door of the jail took from one of the white-faced guards a double-barreled shotgun and with this terrible weapon under his arm stepped out in full view of the milling crowd he waited until the hoarse roar subsided in that roar they were demanding jack the murderer of old men gents said the sheriff i'm plumb tired out today and i'm trying to get a nap you folks bother me a lot matter of fact i gotta have sleep and you're disturbing the peace so get off this street pronto up went the shotgun and the sheriff looked about him 
it seemed to every man in the mob that larrabee's keen eyes were glaring at him as at a ringleader and then the gaping mouth of the gun pointed down at him the crowd wavered split in the center rolled away on both sides and vanished the sheriff spat upon the steps and re-entered the jail End of chapter eight chapters nine ten and eleven of sheriff larrabee's prisoner by martin dexter pseudonym for max brand this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter nine unforeseen succor the late october day dawned with a warm steady breeze out of the south the air was soft as the air of latter may and the sun was kindly warm and bright mary larrabee in honor of the tender blue sky above her put on a dress so white that it dazzled so crisp that it rustled with every step like an autumn wind among the gay leaves and while she smiled at her pretty face in the mirror she knotted at her breast a red ribbon to match the red feather that flowed along the side of her white hat then she went forth like some ancient warrior to battle conscious of invincible armor her own neat little buggy with her own span of bright-eyed bays dancing before it waited in front of the house they whirled her off down the road so fast that the heart of her mother came into her throat she would have called a warning after her girl but in her heart was a sublime conviction that no living creature could possibly have the will or the power to injure mary larrabee as for mary herself in those rounded young arms of hers there was ample power to keep the bays in hand or if they wished to dash off at too reckless and abounding a trot she could soothe and control them with her voice for she had owned them since the day they were foaled and she had raised them to know and to love her whistle her voice and her hand she could have brought them back to a more sedate gait but there was no love of sedateness in mary larrabee that clear tan on her face and on her small strong hands told of many a wild drive and many a wilder gallop through all weathers and over all manner of roads and across the bridge of her tip-tilted nose there was still a suggestion of the mottling of freckles that had been so prominent during her girlhood sedate she only waited until she had turned the corner of the hill and then she let her dainty-footed mares go and they went like the wind while she laughed them on to greater efforts she darted around sharp curves on two wheels and with a shout she roared across shaking bridges she flashed through boontown joyously conscious of drawing eyes after her on either side of the one real street when she stopped before the jail the bays were dripping and entirely willing to pause but still as she tied the hitching strap to the rack they pricked their ears and tried to reach her hands with their foamy muzzles she ran lightly up the steps of the jail and whisked through the dark hall and carried into her father's office a rustle like the wind of the honest outdoors a brightness like the kind sunshine sheriff larrabee as usual had his heels perched on top of his spur-scarred desk and he turned his slow-moving eye upon her since she had grown up to pretty young womanhood he had made a point of making no fuss over her as a sort of antidote to the atmosphere of admiration through which she moved but to-day she bore such a radiance about her that a very diogenes might have dropped his lantern and his cynicism into his tub and stood forth to answer her smile so the sheriff asked how come going to get married she merely laughed at him as he ran his eye over the whiteness of the frock he worshipped every turn of her head every rise and fall of her voice all the profound kindliness of his heart poured forth around her in silence mary understood i've come to see the inside of this old jail she declared i'll call bud said the sheriff yawning he'll show you around the place how come want to take up my business after i quit i might she answered i hit nine out of ten with my twenty-two yesterday i beat judd and he hasn't hardly spoke to me since hm said the sheriff i'll call bud but i don't want you to call bud 
All right, go around by yourself. You know what I really want. I want to see this terrible man, Jack. You do? Of course. Want to see what a real, honest-to-goodness murderer looks like, huh? Well, I guess Jack will be glad to see you and have you stand around and look him over like a wolf in a cage. That'll be a pretty fine party for Jack, right enough. She sat forward in her chair, regarding his grave face intently. Isn't he worse than a wolf, a man that's done a murder, she asked. Does he deserve to be treated kindly? How do you know he killed Benton? Why, everybody knows it. Then everybody knows more'n I do, and I'll tell you this, he's going to be treated like a white man right up to the time that twelve men say he's done a murder. After that, while he's waiting to be hung, he's going to be treated like a white man again. If a girl or a boy of mine... He broke off in his tirade, staring ominously at her. Mary Larrabee sat back in her chair, nodding. "'You like him, don't you?' she asked. "'Why?' "'He's a man,' said the sheriff. "'He had your brothers and me under his gun once, and he didn't shoot to kill, but just to warn off. Keep that idea in your head, Mary.' She grew pale at the thought. "'You still want to see him?' "'I want to see him and thank him,' she said eagerly. "'Why, Dad, how could such a man be a murderer?' She did not quail before the grim accusation which the world had placed against Montaigne. Suddenly she was asking, "'Has he a ghost of a chance of proving himself innocent?' "'I don't know,' replied the sheriff, "'but he don't seem to care. He stopped hoping, what with the crowd yowling to get at him, and that little sneak Levine badgering him. Jack don't seem to care whether he lives or dies. When a gent stops being interested in life, he's about through.' She bowed her head. In the Boontown paper she had read every word of the damning evidence against Montaigne. Now she ran over it bit by bit. Truly it seemed a perfect case against the stranger, unless her father's prejudice in favor of Jack might be based on good grounds. "'Will you introduce me to him?' she asked gently. "'Sure,' said the sheriff. "'If you're going to meet him like that, I'll take you in.' He led the way to the rear of the jail, to the cell of Montaigne, where the latter was rolling a cigarette with careless skill. "'This is my daughter Mary,' said the sheriff. "'I've been telling her how you played white when we were giving you a run, and she thinks she's got something to thank you about. I'm going back in front, Mary.' As the sheriff sauntered away, he saw Jack Montaigne rise and nod to the girl. He heard him say, "'No call for thanking me. Matter of fact, I took the sheriff quite a bit out of his way.' And he grinned as he spoke. "'There's nerve,' muttered the sheriff. "'Enough for ten ordinary men.' But Mary Larrabee was unable to answer that careless speech for a moment. She stared steadily into the lean brown face of the man, the straight-looking eyes, remembering what her father had said. "'He's a man.' That, after all, summed it up, and when the prisoner merely nodded to her, she suddenly stepped close to the bars and stretched her hand through them. "'I do want to thank you,' said Mary Larrabee, "'and I want to say how sorry I am that you're in trouble.' His carelessness disappeared. He straightened, flushing to the roots of his hair, and advancing slowly, took her hand. "'Mighty good of you to come in to say that,' he said huskily. She waved that idea away. First of all,' she said, still probing him and finding nothing sneaking or elusive about his return glance, I want to know what you're doing to protect yourself. Nothing, he answered, because nothing can be done. Because you have no money? Well, that's partly it. Dad would help you, I know, said the girl, but as the sheriff he can't very well do that. However, I can, and I have money. I know the lawyers in town, too, and I can get one to work for you. He shook his head. I've always been set against taking charity, he replied. "'Will you tell me only one thing?' she pleaded. "'Will you simply tell me that you didn't do this horrible, impossible thing?' He watched her for a moment, with a singular hunger, but at length he shook his head with decision. "'It's no use,' he said, "'because there's nothing that can help me, and I've made up my mind not to speak again.' "'That's a final decision?' "'Absolutely.' Then, she answered, I'll tell you that I'm perfectly convinced that you didn't do it. I know you didn't do it, and, and I'm going to prove it to the world that you didn't. 
the flush grew darker and darker on his face as his eyes expanded it's plumb easy to see said jack montaigne that you're your father's daughter he's the squarest shooter i ever met and you sure take after him why if you were a man he paused but she urged him on with well you'd be the sort i'd tie to the sort i'd want to have around in a pinch but the way it stands well there's just one good thing you can do and that's to forget all about me he was so calm about it that the tears rushed to her eyes to hide them she turned abruptly away waved her hand to him and ran out to find her father the latter was walking up and down outside the jail scuffing up the sand and studying it absent-mindedly i've made up my mind to fight for him said the girl on fire with enthusiasm there must be some way most like said her father carelessly most like there is never can tell when something will turn up up and down they walked past the side of the long low building she knocked her shoe against a bright bit of metal and stooped and picked up an old house key she pocketed it automatically as some people do in such cases how asked the girl summing up the case with energy can twelve men with good sense look at jack and think he could commit a crime hm replied her father it's pretty rare to get twelve men together and get good sense out of em and it ain't hard for that little snake levine to hypnotize an average jury no mary you sure got no hope not against levine he's a man-killer but he uses the law to do his killing she stamped in her anger how many other men is he going to hang she asked furiously how many other men are in the jail here waiting until that little rat has time to come out and worry the lives out of them her father smiled a little at this vigorous denunciation we're having dull times he said only one other gent in the jail and that's the hobo mississippi slim at this the girl stopped short where's mississippi in the jail i know i know but what cell got an idea i don't know but for heaven's sake tell me what's his cell right yonder he pointed to a grating a few paces away he may be hearing us now oh exclaimed mary larrabee it's turning my brain upside down is there a chance of what oh nothing said mary and she bolted for her buggy in front of the jail running with the speed and the grace of a boy chapter ten the key to the door she whisked out of boontown as she had whisked into it the bay sweeping the light rig along at a terrific clip presently she turned on to a dim country road made by the wear of travel but never graded straight out of it she drove until she came to a sight of the house of the zellers she drew back her horses to a slower gait and finally pulled up behind the house instantly her eye met a reminder of the crime two parts of a door split cleanly down the center were leaning against the wall near the kitchen window this was the door that both young zeller and jack montaigne claimed to have broken through in an effort to get at the room of the dead man she tied off her horse and turning away found mrs zeller in the act of wiping a milk tin standing at the door of the house the big ugly face of the woman stirred a reluctant smile of welcome mary larrabee she exclaimed how long since you come this way pretty nigh into three years i guess i've heard so much about this murder said mary as she shook hands that i wanted to see the place may i mrs zeller a terrible thing replied mrs zeller the shock it give me i ain't over it yet gus was hit pretty hard too you want to see the room if you please come right up she started to lead the way a terrible thing she repeated and me and gus sure was fond of old mr benton i know some folks didn't like him much he had his ways but all old folks do we were used to him and knew how to make allowances yes we were fond of old benton there's an empty feeling around the house now he's gone mary larrabee shivered with disgust one glimpse of benton's face would be sure warrant that no human being could ever find a spark of affection to waste on the old fellow they stood at the door of the room there's the place said the woman there's where he laid with his head turned a little to one side do you see the mark soap and hot water nothing does any good to take that stain out 
i've worked till my arms ache and still it won't come out poor mr benton i hope they hang that jack as high as the moon you really think he did it think child alive don't i know didn't i hear him talk didn't i see the way he looked when he heard that the poor old man had money in his room right then i says to gus there's no good in this man gus there's no good in him and it sure turned out that there wasn't any well replied mary larrabee solemnly may the guilty man hang she turned away sick from what she had seen and went slowly down the stairs down those stairs jack had fled according to his story up those stairs old benton had dragged himself for the last time on that terrible night every detail of that night of storm and horror came back to her in the open air she drew a great breath of relief and approaching the broken door she drew out the key that she had picked up beside the jail and tried it hastily the lock turned smoothly under the pressure and turned back again mary larrabee drew it forth and dropped the key back into her pocket her heart racing with excitement how come asked mrs zeller following with aggressive curiosity i forgot to say said the girl glibly enough that my father asked me to bring back the lock of the door to benton's room will you let me saw it out mrs zeller fixed her big startling eyes upon the face of mary larrabee frowning evidently she was not at all pleased it don't sound like your father sending you around on jobs like this she declared it don't sound the least bit like him he knew i was coming out here anyway exclaimed mary hm said mrs zeller gloomily you want the lock but why do you want it i never could make any sense out of these legal matters said mary managing to smile in the face of that dark suspicion but that's what dad asked me to bring course if you don't want to part with it i'll simply go back and have him oh it ain't that protested mrs zeller but it'd be more regular if the sheriff was to send out a written order for it or a request for it being that he wants it for evidence oh i suppose it would said the girl but i've already done what he told me to do by asking you for it she made as if to turn away but mrs zeller in a quandary called her back i don't want to hinder the law none she said if this'll help to hang jack why well, take it and welcome to it i'm sure i ain't got any purpose in keeping things back i ain't got anything to hide from your father or any other sheriff oh of course not said mary then i'll take the lock back if you'll let me have a saw mrs zeller was gone a long time in the house apparently hunting for the saw but mary heard the voice of mother and son in heated argument at length mrs zeller came out with the saw and gloomier than ever proceeded to cut out the lock and hand it to mary i hope it brings bad luck to jack whatever his name i hope this lock is the thing that hangs him she said savagely mary untethered the horse and climbed back into her buggy why do you hate jack so much she asked when she had turned the buggy round why because he's a crook said mrs zeller fiercely and because he'd done a murder under my roof and robbed me robbed you asked mary larrabee jury did wouldn't mr benton if he'd a died natural have left me something in his will of course he would have who robbed me of it then why this jack this devil did ain't that clear as day mary shook her head i don't know she said but if jack is a murderer i don't know where we can find men we can trust wait a minute said mrs zeller suddenly starting for the heads of the horses wait a minute hold on mary larrabee i've changed my mind about but a sharp cut of the buggy whip sent the bays sprinting away i can't wait called mary in explanation i have to hurry back then she dashed past the big woman and out onto the road mrs zeller followed a step or two then paused with her arms akimbo and stared after the flying little equipage at length she turned sullenly back toward the house there's a devil in these young girls she confided to her son a little later and i'd give a lot to know what she's up to the little vixen the first thing that mary did could have been seen from the house she halted her team beside the tree where the tramp was known to have kept his fire on that night of nights the sight of the fire she examined carefully and then swung the team back onto the road 
the bays were in a foam when she brought them back into boontown and drew up before the carpenter's shop she found the proprietor in the very act of starting for the country old mrs purvis just phoned in he said if your dad has some business for me mary i guess it'll have to wait mrs purvis is plumb rushed that's the way it goes with old folks they want everything done so fast you'd think they was afraid death would come along before it was done but mr hands said the girl this is a matter of life and death hm said the carpenter and pulled his glasses down on his nose so that he could peer at her over them life and death she placed the lock on the workbench is that a common lock mr hands he examined it took up a bundle of keys and tried some one by one presently the lock was turned under his manipulation common enough lock all right he said i got twenty old keys right here that could turn it mary larrabee uttered an exclamation of despair but she protested i want to prove that this key belongs to that lock and now you spoiled everything for me she drew forth the key and handed it to him let me see muttered the carpenter who was locksmith as well let me see now maybe it does belong but what difference does that make i can fix you up with other keys for it other keys no no mr hans you must prove that this key belongs to this lock well maybe i could you see where the bit of this key is worn off a little that comes from being used in a lock that has a rough place in it i can find out in a minute he set to work with a screwdriver taking the lock apart examined it carefully and then straightened with a grunt of satisfaction look for yourself he said don't need no microscope for this see this place sticking out in the lock that's what's worn away the key must have took a tolerable lot of use to do it but there ain't any doubt see how it fits into the worn place mr hands asked the girl how can i thank you for showing me you saved him saved who but lock and key were snatched from the carpenter's hand and she was gone whirling through the door chapter eleven the whole story at the jail she swept her father into the storm of her enthusiasm key and lock were placed in his great brown hands you see she explained that key has to belong to the lock well mary he admitted it sure looks like it and what do you make of it it must have been brought from the zeller house that's natural no doubt about that and who could have brought it jack i suppose oh dad don't you see that his cell is on the other side of the jail how could he have thrown it there huh it's the tramp dad he's the one who threw it out the window to get rid of the only clue that connected him with the murder isn't that clear her father shook his head frowning don't sound like a strong argument girl but how could that key have come there i don't know did you search slim when you picked him up why should i search him he wasn't near the house then he might have had the key on him when he was brought to the jail well, i suppose so how long would it take to walk from the tree where he had his fire to the house not more than ten minutes do you think not more than that i guess if a gent stepped out lively dad he's the murderer but if he got rid of the key by throwing it out the window he didn't get rid of the money that was taken from benton's chest she pondered a moment will you take a drive with me out to slim's fire he nodded and a moment later they were spinning down the road toward the zeller place once more he might have cashed the money any place around this tree said the girl enthusiastically as she dismounted from the buggy at the side of the fire that's true said the sheriff and he began an ardent search but there was nothing to be found in half a dozen places where boughs joined the trunk at a steep angle he looked but there was no sign of the money or he might have dug a hole suggested the girl at length they examined the ground around the tree within a radius of a hundred feet but there was no sign of earth having been broken still said the girl it must be here he wouldn't wait to hide it any other place because he'd be in such a hurry to get back to his fire isn't that logical before the murder he was seen drowsing by the fire after the murder he was back at his fire again that is his alibi you got all the terms down pat said her father and it sounds reasonable too but what next 
What about the fire itself? Buried paper money in a fire? Larrabee was chuckling. See where he scraped that fire to one side? He first had the fire going on the left. Then he moved it to the right, where it is now, scraping the whole bed of coals. Well, is it reasonable that a man would move his fire once it's going? Isn't the hot bed of coals the most important part of a campfire, Dad? What's well, gospel, Mary? Then perhaps he moved that fire to cover something. The sheriff said not a word, but simply kicked away the ashes and the charred remains of the fire. He thrust his hand down into the half-baked earth below it, tearing it away in clods, until at last he uttered a cry, worked a moment longer, and then stood up, holding a handful of dirty greenbacks. But Mary Larrabee, staring, saw two visions pass before her eyes, and money had no part to play in either. She saw Mississippi Slim hanging with a rope knotted around his neck, and she saw Jack walking out of the jail a free man. There in the hand of her father was the evidence that would accomplish both purposes. The money and the key, the sheriff was saying. Well, it sounds pretty good, but we can't be sure. The thing to do, Mary, is to get a confession out of Slim, if we can. That's the way to clear Jack. Otherwise, even if he gets off, his name won't be plumb cleared. Once a gent is accused of a bad crime, his name is black the rest of his life. I'll have to call in the snake, Levine, to help. My, won't he grind his teeth when he finds out what I've learned. On the way back to Boontown, he detailed briefly the scene between Jack and the district attorney, which he had interrupted, and the mad fervor of the attorney's desire to hang the prisoner. She had the pleasure, an hour later, of seeing the district attorney swallow the bitter pill and admit that he had been wrong. But in five minutes he had regained some of his happiness. One trail was lost, but another had been opened. No matter what man died, a death was a death. Indeed, with marvelous elasticity of spirits, he was rubbing his hands and walking up and down his office in a fine heat of inspiration, rehearsing the evidence bit by bit. At length he said, "'It's clear as day. He did it, but a good lawyer could get him off, probably. Somebody else might have buried that money under the tree.' Somebody else might have tossed the key into the sand. The confession is what we need, and the confession is what I'm going to get. Come along. Never in her life could the girl forget the scene that followed. She and her father accompanied the district attorney back to the jail and into the cell of Mississippi Slim, where the latter was walking busily up and down, getting my exercise for the road, he told them. The attorney took out his pad at once. Now, Slim, he said, I want to go over one part of your evidence. Many times as you want, Chief, said Mississippi glibly. It was about what time when you first saw Jack? I don't know, ten or after, maybe. He disappeared down the road toward the house? Yes. Good. Now, when you asked for food at the Zeller place earlier in the evening, what did you do when you were turned from the door? Went up the road. You didn't stay about for a while? No. Didn't try to get into the house, maybe, and walk off with something to get even with him for turning you out? The district attorney chuckled, and Slim laughed loudly. I wish I had, he said. Did you ever see this? asked Levine, with a sudden and harsh change of voice, and he produced the key in the flat of his hand. There was an even more startling change in that rat-sharp face of Slim, as he settled back on his bunk and sneered at them. Playing tricks, huh? he asked. I'll do no more talking, not until I got a lawyer here. All right, said the district attorney, but I suppose you're willing to hear a little story? Talk your head off, said Slim fiercely, but don't ask me no questions. It begins, said Levine, with the moment Jack rode on toward the house. You looked after him, and you began to wonder if he might not have better luck than you did. Particularly you wondered what would happen when that big fellow tried to force the Zellers to give him a handout, huh? Well, you got so curious that after a time you decided it was worth getting a soakin to see the party. So you got up and followed. You came to the kitchen door and saw him go inside. You listened for a while outside the window till you were sure that he was being fed. And the moment you knew that, you were wild with anger. You wanted to do something to injure those people. 
So you sneaked around the house, looking for a place to get in, eh? The face of Slim was grave with boredom. There was no other expression in it. Finally, went on the district attorney, you found you could shinny up one of the veranda posts and get onto the roof. By the time you got up there, the old man Benton was just coming back into the room, and he settled down in a chair near the window. Only for a moment, though. After a time, he went over to his chest and opened it. You saw him take out some money and make sure of it. You saw him lock the chest and saw the pocket into which he dropped the key. That right? Slim merely yawned. Then, said Levine, the old man came back to his chair and sat down to read. A minute later, you began to work. You tried the window behind his chair. It came up without making a sound. Inch by inch you lifted it, pressing very softly for fear of a squeak. And all the time the old man kept right on reading, eh? This is sure a fool story, declared Slim. Maybe you think anybody would believe it. You got the window up at last, insisted Levine, and then you slipped your hands in and settled them around the throat of Benton. He hardly made a struggle. At least whatever struggle he made was not loud enough to be heard above the roar of the rain on the roof. So you slipped in when Benton stopped wiggling and you gave him a look. His face was purple. He wasn't breathing. His eyes were popping out of his head, and he looked dead as a doornail. You locked the door. Then you fished out the key from his pocket and took out that money. But while you were stuffing it into a pocket, you heard a shriek behind you. The old fellow was only partly stifled. You saw him getting up out of the chair and staggering toward you to fight for his money. You had to act quickly. You had to get rid of him and get back to your fire. You caught up a piece of firewood, hit him over the head, and without waiting to see how it ended, you jumped through the window, ran over the veranda roof, jumped off, and made it back to your fire, and— There was a sound of gasping breath. Slim had risen from his bunk with staring eyes. "'Where were you hid in that room?' he asked. "'Say, how did you see it?' The Boontown paper gave much credit to the district attorney for the cleverness with which he had fastened the meshes upon the real criminal and freed an innocent man. It gave a long write-up to Fitzpatrick Levine, while the part which Mary Larrabee had played disappeared in a single paragraph. Levine, as usual, took all the credit to himself. But Mary Larrabee cared not a whit about reporters and papers. She was too preoccupied that evening in hearing from Jack his name and the history of his past. She was interested to the point of tears while he told her of his life before that wild night of storm and murder, how he had lived with his sister and brother-in-law, how to raise much-needed money his brother-in-law had made a practice of changing brands on the cattle that he caught off the range, how exposure had threatened, and how he, the man without a family, had taken the blame on his own wide shoulders and slipped away out of the country, penniless and despairing, but determined to give his sister's family a fighting chance to live in honor. For the first time and the last she heard all this with misty eyes, and it was never again referred to, nor were any of the events of the Benton murder ever mentioned in the house. But when she was Mrs. Jack Montaigne, Mary kept in a secret place, to be looked at on holy days, the little worn key that had saved the life of one man and sent another to his death. End of chapter 11 End of Sheriff Larrabee's Prisoner by Martin Dexter, pseudonym for Max Brand.